Good morning, Camille. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Ohio. We really appreciate it. Good morning. It. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> it's wonderful that you can participate in this democratic pro uh, process via Zoom, via Ohio, the miracles of modern technology. So we've got uh, three folks today that are going to ask questions. I'm going to ask you questions. And Linda's going to do some follow-ups. Um, and then um, let's see, we've got a timekeeper. Uh, that's no, me yes and uh when when uh we reach we're going to tell you at the beginning how long approximately you have and then uh virginia will wave her hand if when we're nearing the end of the question so it's a sign to finish up so we can get through all the questions so thanks again so much for joining us uh tell us first in a three three minute three minutes tell us how long you've lived in chapel hill and why you are running and what present involvement in community uh, experiences and issues that has made would make you a good candidate? You know, I heard just a little bit, but, but I read the the questions before. How long have I lived in Chapel Hill? Is your question, um, Julie? And I was trying to turn on my headset. And then, what was the follow up to that? Just why you're running? Why you're running? Thank you. Yes, I have been in the area um, since 2005, moved here from Louisville, Kentucky, have lived um, where I currently am for six and a half years and have been in Chapel Hill um, for a little bit longer than that moved. And that was, that was housing issues. So I've been in Chapel Hill uh, lived in Chapel Hill longer than six and a half years, but continuously for the past six and a half. As to why I'm running, it's because I would like for someone um, who has experience, lived experience with difficulty with finding housing, secure, safe housing. Um, I want to elevate that voice. Okay. And would you comment on some of the experiences that might qualify you to be a candidate? Certainly. I, uh, since arriving in 2005 to the Durham area, I was in Durham, Orange, I think, Turkey Farm Road. Mill Nature Preserve. Um, I, having lived here, um, have been very involved in the community. First, it was through my children. And then as my two youngest went off to college, I looked to see how could I get involved that was not tied to my children. It wasn't kind of a, an obligatory engagement. It was how can I get more involved with my community um, of my choice and I have free reign. I've been involved with Piedmont Health Services on their board for several years. Um, I was on the board of several other nonprofits, including one that deals with immigrants and food, um, one that deals with um, workplace development, and um, also I'm engaged through the Rotary Club, and we're very involved in this community. This particular club that I belong to is not one of the, it's not the largest don't think it's the smallest. It's just right for me. And all of its members are very involved. Um, that's what spoke to me. Our motto is service above self. My college's um, motto, non ministrari sed ministrare, um, sed ministrare non ministrari. Oh, I'd be in trouble. Uh, to serve, not to be served. But we have flipped that. We've also said we need to recognize that there are times that we do need to be served. We try to lead by service, uh, but we also try to um, acknowledge our vulnerabilities and ask for help. And this is a, a more recent development amongst the alumni. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we have a, another question as part of the sure. introductory part. And that is that in recent years, pool development, uh, developer campaign donations have become much more common. And just a straight up question, do you intend to accept campaign donations from developers who do business with the town? I would welcome it. And I understand I received um, 
an email from Charles Humble who shared with me the breakdown of uh, recent elections. I have to tell you, as a person um, who does not have deep pockets and also understanding the limitations that the town has set on um, the amount that can be given to a campaign, 378, I still have not gotten an answer as to that algorithm, but I understand its purpose, which is to not have any one entity give um, too much and be too much of an influence. Let me clarify your answer because I wasn't sure I understood it. So really the question is, would you accept donations from developers from out of town that are going to have projects before the town? Yes, and I said, yes, I would. Now, if it were immediate projects, probably not. But if there are developers with whom I have a relationship, I would. And so I haven't received any, but yes. Thank you. All right, moving on to a mix of housing. These are all- Excuse me, Julie. Yes. Um, how much time did I have for that answer? Because I was trying to clarify why, why was, I answered the yes or no question. How are we doing on time, Virginia? Well, unfortunately, I thought we we're going on to the next question. So I go for it. Count. So go for it. we'll come back. No, I think. So. Yeah. OK. All right. Uh, mix of housing. Um, please discuss affordable housing needs in our community. And that's just for three minutes. And then we'll have some follow ups. Thanks. Great. So there is a great need of housing across the board. It is not just any one um, income level, uh, any one group. Uh, we are we are really at need, and I know that you sent to me, Julie, just this morning, um, a report that came out from uh, the committee, and I just had a, a chance to just quickly look over it uh, because I had to go back out to my car to get something. But there's a great need, and one discussion that comes up from the council uh, recently is the missing middle, right? Uh, we're giving attention to the um, extremely low, low, moderate income. Um, there are policies that are, are trying to be addressed. Some exist, some we wish to exist, but we can't forget about that missing middle. And there are um, young professionals who would like to live here. Um, it, they get educated here. They can't afford, those students who educate, are educated here can't afford to stay here. I talked with someone who is in housing about this, and they said, frankly, what you need is an increase in housing to reduce the burden, um, the supply and demand. So if we have greater housing, greater units of housing and across the spectrum, that reduces the, um, the demand on it. Right now, that's what we're seeing with vehicles those prices are skyrocketing because there's such a limitation on what's available due to um, COVID. This existed already in our housing market. And Just a so, quick follow-up. It, it, you say you, it reduces the demand. You're also saying it reduces the price. Yes, yes, yes. that's correct. Um, the lower the supply, greater the demand, of course, the prices can be commanded for more. Okay, Linda? Um, what are your suggestions for avoiding the displacement of low and moderate income residents and for ensuring that additional affordable housing will not be segregated by race or income? Right. Um, displacing, we don't have that many um, low income, and it was low and, and moderate, I'm afraid I don't have Low we and moderate. Many, yes, we don't have that many now. Fortunately, the organization with whom I worked, um, Community Home Trust, retains the ownership of the land and that keeps that um, secure, those homes. That's only a, a small segment that addresses, that now currently houses those populations. Mm -hmm. And so we need to look at ways to keep it affordable for those homes to be maintained. And um, one consideration, one area that I'm thinking of is the North Side neighborhood, right? We have, um, with the recent um, 
oh my words, um, tax implications there. Could be forcing people out. And I actually met someone, uh, I was at an event, uh, it was noted that I had just announced my candidacy and this couple came to me and they're relatively new in the North side neighborhood. And he said, I wish people would understand who live there that the increase in their, um, in their, I cannot think of this. The word. property tax. Yes, the yeah. increase mm -hmm. in their property tax, but it's based on what the county does and it's the yeah, assessment. Yeah. The assessment, right? The assessment. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, that's actually very good for us, um, and shouldn't be shouldn't be um, rejected. And I said, but do you understand that that assessment causes the the tax implications for that? He goes, yes, but the resale value. So there is a lack of understanding. I don't think there was a lack of compassion on this person. I think, okay, so sorry. Okay. All right. How might conditional zoning be used effectively by the town council to further the goals of providing a mix of housing for all incomes? Yeah. Um, are you familiar with conditional zoning? <coughs> I would love for you to expand on that. And I'll. <clears throat> yes, so we recently, the state legislature, <clears throat> thanks to certain lobby groups, change the rules and conditional zoning is now uh, required for most projects um, that in order to get a permit. And so the special use permit is now gone. And so that provides more flexibility. And so that's the question. How might zoning, conditional zoning be used effectively by the town council to provide a mix of housing? Right, I was just talking with Amy um, Ryan about this. Um, not long ago, and uh, and I was trying to understand one project that's been proposed. And because I don't have a firm grasp, I'm going to tell you that I'm I'm clearly hypothesizing here about that. But the conditional zoning, um, I imagine, could be used to um, work with the developer on um, if you create what we've had. Um, with those who are selling their units now, that's what I understand what's been in place for quite some time, then we require this. And setting up those requirements with the developers, what I'm not being very clear this morning, but what I would like to do is for this town to be very clear with developers, what our goals are and what the, um, the expectations are and what the guidelines are so that that can be addressed at at the forefront okay um, yeah okay moving on yeah. um the next uh, question deals with the economy building a strong economy which is of course important and so there are four short questions here most of them are two minutes but the first one is three so um, this is a uh, important one to us. Has the form-based code as implemented in Chapel Hill's Blue Hill District strengthened our economy and how or how not? Right, it has, um, I have not been able to ascertain that from uh, the information there. So this is purely anecdotal, meaning um, I would like to look at the stats there. I did talk with Dwight Bassett about the impact. This was before I had um, uh, access to your questions about the impact of um, students attending. And he said there were only two students that came from the Berkshires. That was one, you know, that, that residence. But as far as economic impact, I see far more activity. Again, anecdotal. I see far more activity happening in that area in the commercial um, way. Can and you give I, some, us some specifics on that, please? Certainly. So the um, despite COVID, I have still seen an increase in the parking lots in the stores where I am. Um, I have seen, which actually surprised me how active it's been. Um, right there, there's the casual pint. I've noticed that that attracts people. Those new stores that are 
are there. And then I have seen people walking from, I think that's the Elliot um, coming in, walking to the, um, the commercial area there. And one thing that I heard from my daughter, um, please know that I do look beyond my household, but one thing that I heard from my daughter was, she said, I feel very fortunate to be here because I can access these. She is 26 and um, she likes the idea of being able to get from um, one place where she spends money to another and that they're complimentary places. She's living in one of the apartment complexes there. What's that now? She's living in one of the parts. No, she actually lives with me. We're off oh. of her on our one road. Well, yes. And so very, it's walk. It, okay. Right. And so it's very walkable. Okay. Um, we can take two ways, Booker Creek or down Dobbins to get right. to. Right. Yeah. So um, here's another question. What are your ideas for how town council might direct the use of Let's see. No, wait a minute. I'm getting on the wrong question. I'm so sorry. That's a follow up for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. This is a question having to do with the economy. Let's stay on on track here. Um, the UNC Chapel Hill housing report is out and uh, it was presented to the council and it's getting a lot of attention. Do you have have you had time to gather any lessons from that study, Camille? I have not. And was that the portion that was included in what you sent this morning. So when I looked at that, just briefly, one thing that I noticed was it, it, re, it confirmed what has been um, stated that there's a great demand. The, um, in the 2000, 2000s, we had, um, I was just trying to think, 2000s and 2010s, I think to 2010s, we've seen more growth with the rentals um if that is correct but uh student population i think has gone up 10 percent as far as what's here and i'll tell you when i joined community home trust in 2014 one thing that i heard from robert as we were meeting with folks was that it was easier for developers and i asked robert this again not long ago robert dowling um do you think that still holds true? Did I recall correctly those conversations that it was easier for them to get a loan, a commercial loan to develop apartments than it was condos because they were going for density. Correct. And we he said it was, that. yeah. And he said that it was. And so um, I see why it's driving that. Um, but um, what I what I glean from my quick um scan of, of what you share this morning is, again, we need housing, period. We don't need the high-end housing, but we've got to figure out a way to, um, to recruit developers who are willing to build for these lower income households. And when I say lower, I mean not, um, thank you, Virginia. And then, um, there's another uh, question about your view um, about residential housing, and we have lots of it as the report pointed out. And so what is your understanding about the cost of building residential or proving residential as a trade-off between what the costs the town to provide services? Right, well, um, looked at that quickly, but what I did get to look at a little bit more deeply was what you had shared with me, Julie, right after our first um, meeting, and that was helpful. Of all of the costs that go into supporting a household, we don't get the offset that the commercial would, um, that it's actually a greater cost to the town, and exactly. that is one of the reasons why uh, my platform, and I didn't share this in the beginning, I'll do it quickly, um, I want to increase housing that's affordable to more people. I want to bolster economic development because we can't do the first one. We cannot achieve that if we don't bolster that economic development, which means having more uh, businesses have that. Okay. All right, now we're moving on to green infrastructure and- uh, Julie, excuse me, but I don't think you finished all of the questions under a strong economy. 
Well, there um, is a conditional zoning one. I, I'm happy to go back to it. I was going to kind of skip ahead on it, but I, I'm glad to go ahead. I'm going to try to keep them all the same. All right. So how might conditional zoning and other policies be used to support locally owned businesses? Right. Um, having talked with Dwight um, about supporting local businesses, because I am concerned, it's one thing to help them open their doors. It's another thing to keep them uh, operating. And so um, it, I was looking at not this, but um, another proposal that the task force uh, or the group that have been working on this put forth and ensuring that there is there are funds to support this, um, to support the, the businesses, helping them to, this is in conversation, helping those businesses to not just sustain, but also have a growth plan if they wish, um, that there be resources, not just funding, but resources for them to to really develop as institutions um, of commerce. You're talking about town resources, correct? Yes, I am. So I out, am. Of, out of that office, there should be some kind of fund to help small businesses. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. And also resources to um, where really helping them to understand uh, for the small businesses, there's a small business association, um, helping them to connect with um, support services that they can use to develop their businesses and grow if they wish. Okay. But having, okay. So now we're moving on to green infrastructure. So um, what are your priorities? And this is a big question. So you only have three minutes, but just give mm -hmm. us thoughts. Uh, what are your priorities for green infrastructure for the town? And here are some of the things that would be covered by green infrastructure, parks, tree canopy, transit, stormwater control, greenways, and green spaces. Right. We do need that plan. We do need to have um, green spaces throughout the town um, uh, insured. And um, Bill Webster, before he retired, was working on a plan for parks and more, and he actually will be here this weekend for the wedding. Um, I know he was very proud of that, and we need to look, because green spaces also can attract development, and so being mindful of that, I was the executive director of Durham Central Park, um, helped to secure funding for the second phase of the pavilion, oversaw the construction of it in its entirety. Um, and what we did was we restored the space that was urban wasteland. It became a gathering place for people in the city. And so it can't be, um, it can't be missed, dismissed that green spaces can attract. There has to be a balance though. And so I believe that if I'm not hearing a clear vision of how we're going to use um, our green space, um, as well as our development. I'm, I'm seeing pocket here, pocket here as we address it. But I think if we talk about those, the development and the green space, the greenway corridors, how do people get safely um, on their bicycles? The green, yes. Um, how do we do that? And um, okay. for me, there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but I think that there needs to be um, they go hand in hand. So Linda, you have a follow up to that yeah. right on that subject. What are your ideas for how town council might direct the use of open tracts of land, such as Legion Road, East Town, Green Track, J Street? Right, looking at the backdrop of our needs, right? We have to look, what are our goals as a town? Um, it is clear, everyone, the, the, the number one uh, issue seems to be affordable housing. That actually is my number one issue, but that's not the only issue. Economic development is another. Transportation is another. Honoring green space as we address all of these needs to be considered as well. So identifying what our needs are, what are our priorities for these goals and looking at 
all of these spaces, these open tracts of land that we have, this green space, and seeing if we do this, what is the cost for these others? Because whatever choice we make, it's going to be at the expense of something else. And we need to be clear about what we want and how does each, before we get to piece by piece, but we look at it as the full diet, the full meal that we have, um, I'm consumed with food. I like rich, uh, diverse plate. I'm not going to be healthy off of one, um, one source. We're not going to be a healthy community if we just look at affordable housing. First of all, it's not possible. I know that. Thank We're you. not going to be, okay. Um, how might the town's climate action plan be revised to address short-term achievable goals? Give an example. Okay. Well, um, as there has been construction and there are other proposals for construction that removes trees or have removed trees, um, and I have seen Molly's um, measurements, she shared them, I think on Facebook, we're now friends on Facebook and she's taking the temperature readings. All right, that's done, those trees have been cut. So what else do we do? And that goes back to honoring the green space. If we remove that, how are we going to provide cooling systems, uh, filtration systems um, that our, our greenery provides naturally? Um, short term, are we investigating the, um, the shades in more public areas? I have seen private uh, commercial uh, businesses use those, but we need to look at ways to provide that, um, which is as a respite. But yes, also planting more trees. And um, it's very easy, challenging that we need to be creative of how to retain our tree canopy while also developing. That is, um, that is definitely um, going to be a tension point. Okay. Okay. Um, and one more question, two minutes. What pedestrian and bike improvements would you prioritize? Okay. Um, there, the, I understand that there is funding for this, but the um, North South, this is not the correct name, um, MLK. Mm -hmm. I know that it is extremely dangerous for bicyclists to travel that corridor. And there are people who have told me that they would like to. And there are- Sorry, which, which corridor again? The MLK. Oh, uh, no, okay. okay. Uh, yes. Um, and I know that there are plans that the state will be working on that, but the money is not available at this time. I won't get into that. But that is, we have, um, we have trails, greenway trails, that people would love to continue to ride their bicycles on, but they reach points where they can't, not safely. I saw a child yesterday ride her bicycle, um, not walk it, but ride her bicycle from um, Eastgate. Um, she crossed, um, she crossed Franklin and I thought she was going to go Booker Creek, but she went up the side there. We need to have more um, safe, like that, cross crossways for people. That connectivity needs to be needs to occur. Okay. <laughs> um, so the another question is dealing with public engagement, but the first question really uh, has to do with town planning. And so the town council staff have had many outreach planning exercises. You know, could name them all off, you know, 2020 Comprehensive Plan, Central West, um, Ephesus Fordham, and so on. And they've adopted town plans as a result of all that public engagement that occurred. So how would you be guided by these plans as you make land use decisions? Right, so that should be something that we reference. One thing that I think also needs to happen is communication so that we can have a, um, a broad representation of the community at those meetings. But we've already captured that 
um, and we need to refer to them frequently. Uh, even if we distill the information from those meetings, and I believe that they, they are attempting to do this, but it's almost as though it gets captured and then lost, you know, trying to, it's like my, my personal filing system. Um, when I first started, I put things away and then there's no real system. It's tucked away safely. Now we need to um, really make it accessible for people to find that information, especially our policymakers, especially our council members to be able to refer back to that with the turnover that we have. And I think it's great. I'm not saying um, there's not the institutional history, the memory of how decisions were made. And I think that that is something that should be referred to. This is what, um, this is what the town, the people of the town have said, is it time to uh, revisit it? Is it so old? Then yes, but I think that we do need to refer to those and we need to have a online system that's easy to access it on the website. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Follow up, um, how will you handle citizen requests and comments? What efforts will you make to increase public engagement, especially with marginalized communities to meet the needs of residents? Right. First of all, um, open. I am extremely curious and want to know. Um, one thing that I was accused of when I launched my campaign was, we don't know what you stand for. And I said three things, but I really want to hear from you because those three things were important to me. I needed to get it, um, an idea of what was important to the community. We do need to listen. And how do we get them engaged, especially those who are uh, have been disenfranchised minority, we need to put some effort into it. Just like I do on boards um, in business, you have, to, you have to extend yourself even more. If you see that there is a group not, not participating, you need to exert more. So as the town, uh, if I were a town council member, I would look at ways of how to engage them. If we have to go to them, then we have to go to them because they have to feel that trust that they are truly desired to give input. So being extremely active and going, we cannot tuck these communities behind trees and leave them there. We so, have got so to engage I, them. I, I, I know this is something that is important um, and the town has talked about it, but how practically could we do that? I mean, would you see it as your job as a council member to do that? To, to reach out to these communities? I mean, who's going to do the, who's going to do the work of reaching out? Question is, because right. right now we have we don't have enough planners to cover the work right now. Mm. We're going to have to prioritize. And yes, I would be very happy to, as a town council member, to engage. But I think that we need to reprioritize and dedicate. Um, hours staffing to that. We've identified, we continue to identify this as a, an issue, communication as well as reaching these, um, these groups. So if we're in agreement, then we need to show it with our budget, which means to reprioritize. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then the final question, and then we're going to maybe, if you have a few extra minutes, Camille, we might yes. have follow-ups because we got kind of a late start. So um, let me ask you um, for an example of a town council decision that you agreed with, and then I'm gonna ask you for one that you disagreed with. And so explain why you agreed with this decision. All right. One um, that I believe um, was extremely charged and I came into it uh, and it's what compelled me to run was the um, 1200 MLK development. And it is because those 73, I believe it was 73 households that are back there, those individuals own their structures. Most, if not all, own those structures. They don't own that land. And uh, what I understood, and I have to say that I am confident I don't have all of the information that the council had. Um, so I'm going based on my limited information. But what I understood 
was that um, the council had managed to negotiate, had managed to secure the um, the year long leases, the cap on the three year um, before the rent could be um, increased, and also the fifteen year. Um, agreement to keep that as a mobile home park. So the developer wouldn't do it now and then kick them out. Um, the So you agreed with that decision? I did, I did. Uh, because the we did not, we didn't have a, um, a plan B for those folks if they had to leave. It's not as though they could move those those homes to another location. Mobile homes are not a sustainable, affordable housing option, in my opinion, not the ones that reside there. And so that that less than ideal um, situation that they had, I agreed with that vote. Okay. And then would you give an example of one you disagreed with and why and how you would have handled it? Right. And that one is much tougher. Um, and I just got a phone call about this and um, also attended Monday night's town hall meeting. Um, and yes, um, knowing what we know now, you know, that had been um, the Booker Creek um, the more recent one, the one that is being protested right now of stop, don't tear down. That's the trail that I walk um, um, when I do a, a concrete trail. I prefer the rocks and roots. And anyway. Um, so this yes. is the one opposite of Old Forest Creek there on the south side. Is that what you're speaking of? The, the uh, I'm, I'm oh, talking about the one that they have reprioritized and they want it to move on. Uh, Right. soon, but we, um, the community addressed it. And so there's been a pause put on that, but it's part of a larger plan, the six basins, stormwater basins. Um, what I understand, and someone said to me, they didn't review it completely. And I couldn't speak to that because I have not seen those meetings um, and, and talked with someone and, and when this reprioritization happened, there was the um, confidence in the previous um, administration, the one that passed the, the full spectrum and thinking, okay, we're just reprioritizing, not understanding what the impact would be. And so um, it's very easy for me to say, this is what I would have done. But now that I've seen what they, you know, what they fell to of not thoroughly reading that, it's very easy for me to armchair, you know, um, quarterback and say, read, read that through. So um, yes, those implications, if that, if something is being proposed like that, um, and Alan Boyne said, I talked with him. This is another thing that goes into this. I asked him, how do you make decisions? He said, first, I look to see if it fits with what I shared with the community or my goals. B, I look to see what the costs are. Who gets, because there's, there are always costs. And I said, that's what I believe. And he goes, and three, how can we mitigate those, um, those harms done or those to that group? Is it possible? What can we do? And so it's not just what do we gain, it's what is at risk. And I don't think that what's at risk was thoroughly examined. You know, but there was no cost benefit analysis at all of the value of keeping a lot of trees, <laughs> which were all <laughs> going to be cut down. So, all right. Well, that's very good. So we've completed all the questions. So I think if we could take five minutes uh, to do follow ups for folks that are on the line, that would be good. Virginia? Um, Camille, you said you had three uh, goals or priorities in your campaign, and one was affordable housing. What are the other two? Right. Increase affordable housing, bolster economic development, and honor green space. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Linda? Hey, um, you mentioned when it came to housing, the 
the economic idea of supply and demand. Chapel Hill has um, in progress and recently built a total of 8,000 apartment units, but supply and demand is not applying here. Prices are not going down. So what I think you need to take a look at is something called real estate investment trusts and how they are driving all of this apartment building because these are basically investment vehicles. Um, and by law, they have to have a certain rate of return. And if you invest in them, you can make a lot of money very fast. And this is what is happening, not just to Chapel Hill, but it's happening on a global scale. You have even pension funds investing in real estate investment trusts. And that's why you're getting all of these apartments. And unlike housing that is for sale, if you have um, apartments, you're getting income every month. You're getting a steady stream. So that's, that's some of behind what is happening here in Chapel Hill. It's an investment vehicle for people who have some money who want to make more money. Right. May I comment to that? Yeah. So when the supply and the demand, the supply that I'm talking about is not just one kind. And yes, um, the apartments can command that. And so we need to make it um, possible for development for cell units. Mm -hmm. And I was listening um, to the developer who is building on, Ir who wants to build on Irwin Road, changed Scott it from Bradley. apartments. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Changed it from apartments to townhomes. And then council member Stegman asked, um, Karen asked, well, what is the rate that you're looking to charge? Yeah. And he mm -hmm. tried to defer and she said, you have to have a target. You always have a target when mm -hmm. you're doing this. And the amount that he said, if I remember correctly, mid 400s to the 600s for a townhome, starting at 1500, going up to 2500. And I'm thinking, okay, I can see why he did that because they were expecting money month after month you know, until they wanted to sell that property. Now it is being sold that way. Um, so yes, I understand. And this is where we have to be creative. What we want as far as, as housing, the types of housing, we need to figure out how to make it possible for those developers to do that. Mm -hmm. to just price point. Or excuse me, just to underscore what Linda said, uh, I, I read that uh, recently two of these big apartment buildings have been resold to other developers. Both Trilogy and the Elliott have been resold in the last month or two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone's making money. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I had a question. We didn't quite get into transportation much, Camille, and you mentioned the North-South BRT yes. uh, as, as being delayed. Um, yes because that's true, it's being delayed and it's gonna probably be five years out now. But could you comment a little bit about, uh, Chapel Hill's grown a lot. We're building a lot of new buildings, a lot of new people, a lot of new parking places <laughs> because they, they probably won't be able to ride our free bus system because we're actually cutting routes and not adding them. Um, what, what, what's your, what are your comments about what we can do about improving the transit situation? Right. And let's be fair, the reason why we're cutting the, the routes is not because we want to, it's because we don't have the labor. We are experiencing labor shortage just like everyone else. Um, and it is causing um, freight harm in many industries and driving the costs up for things. But as far as transportation, what can we do? Um, Again, we need to look at how do we make it possible for people to get around on, you know, in alternative measures um, than just their vehicles and jumping into their car to do this. I was fortunate um, to have, um, well, we all are, most of us to have access to our bus system. Not everybody in Chapel Hill actually has access to the bus system. It's, it can be difficult for some. But it was very easy for me. It's very easy for me to walk where I need immediately. Um, and that goes back to linking those greenways so that the um, alternative modes of transportation are safe. 
Okay. Um, all right, we've got some other folks on the line. Let's see. Um, anyone else would like a question? Or at 904, so. Okay, we'll just try to have one more minute then. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's see. All right. Well, um, we really appreciate you joining us today, Camille, and we wish you um, a wonderful celebration, family Thank celebration. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to close with, I, um, at the top of this, after I tried with my headphones, um, shared with you, because I like to be very transparent, and I like to be frank and candid, that yes, I would not turn down money from developers outside of town. We have some developers who I haven't accepted any yet. I haven't uh, engaged in that, but it's very hard for me as one who does not have, um, you know, one, I'm not married, so I can't get those uh, resources from a spouse, those unlimited resources. I can't give myself a personal loan. Um, so I can't be as, um, as closed off, restricted as that. I can be ethical. So if I think that there's a conflict of interest, that there is something that's coming up um, that I see in um, the next year, no, I would not. But if there are developers outside of this town that with whom I've worked uh, through Community Home Trust, who I have a relationship with, I would consider that. But I want to be frank with you that um, that would be, it's ethically, how would I, would it be a conflict of interest for them? But I can't say across the board that I would not. Um, I do try to be ethical. Um, I do try to be transparent and um, so I just wanted to close with that. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the comment. It's it's important to us because in past elections, it does seem to have played a role in in behavior actually, and in some cases, the money was pooled and was not reported until after people voted. <laughs> so people yeah. didn't even have the information that this candidate had received these contributions. So right. also a transparency issue. Right. If you if you notice my. Um, finance, uh, my treasurer is a, is a retired uh, corporate finance executive. He filed our paperwork very soon. Um, he let it sit for a few days, but um, not long into July did we file ours and we learned that we didn't have to file, we had already reported some information, but and we're not, we're disclosing everyone who has given to us. So there are some that we could keep anonymous. We don't feel that we need to. We're very proud of those and we would hope they're proud to support me, but we're very proud of those who choose to support this campaign. Okay, thank you, Camille. I, I appreciate you. Thank you. I really appreciate this time. Have fun at the wedding. Thank, thank you, I will.